Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, final day of our convention. It's rather hard to imagine every time we get to this point that uh, such a wonderful thing can end. We're not there yet, but uh, treasure the moments. Uh, at this point during the course of our uh, conventions, we tend to have a period where we receive questions. There was a box that was placed here, and we got a number of questions, far too many for us to go through during our brief time up here. But uh, we will try to uh, do what we can with the questions that uh, you have asked. Uh, just to introduce the people who are up here on the stage with me, immediately to my left is Marcos Resende from Brazil, former general secretary there, member of the general council of the international TS and a very active member for quite some time now. Linda Oliveira is the next one. Uh, when you saw your program, it listed the names Marcos, myself, Pedro, and then it said Lady. This is Lady. <laughs> Linda Oliveira comes from Australia and has been the past general secretary there, and many of you know her. She's been very, very active in the theosophical world for quite some time as well. To her left is the famous, and some might say infamous, Pedro Oliveira who has also been an active member for the longest time. He was, in fact, the international secretary here for Rada Bernier in the immediate past administration. Uh, he's an author, most recently, of the book about Besant's, Annie Besant's life in India, which is an excellent book. In fact, it's one that when we have to gift books to uh, visiting speakers, that's the one we like to choose. Although, Pedro, you do have to send us some more copies. So we have some questions, and we'll, uh, we'll dive right into it, and we'll do our best. So first one, uh, nothing small here. What is the responsibility of the Theosophical Society as an institution in the interconnected world, and especially nowadays? Probably each of you should grab your own personal microphone. And then feel free. And if you don't feel free, Marcos. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. What is the responsibility of the TS in this interconnected world? That's a profound question. Because the society itself during history was always in the vanguard of humans' evolution. In several times, we could see uh, through the Theosophical Society uh, some ideas, some teachings, some uh, ways to live were put to humanity and we can see that humanity changed. But the responsibility is to keep on as the vanguard. We need to not to crystallize. We need to be an institution open to the living truth. That is not only the truth that are in the books, but the truth related to how we live, how we deal with others, how we act in the world, then I think we have a great responsibility because this society was conceived completely different of other institutions. We see the institutions have a particular creed, a particular standard, of thought, but society does not has it, and it needs to be open to the higher level, higher level from where living truth come. But this depends on each member, on each group, on each lodge, and in this interconnected world, things occurs happy. happy uh, 
fastly. Uh, everything is connected in a physical way, but to keep on as a light in the shadow that human consciousness is, it's very important to each one to find the inner connection to the planes where living truth comes. Thank you, Marcos. Uh, anyone else? The Theosophical Society was formed to make it known to the world that theosophy exists. We live in a time during which we can really avail ourselves of modern technology, just as we are here today, quite wonderfully, uh, to communicate to the world that theosophy does exist, uh, does indeed exist, uh, and that uh, aside from the set of teachings, each can find within them their own unique way to that state of divine wisdom, which is ultimately what theosophy is, uh, which is quite a wonderful thing. We live in a time uh, of during history uh, and in Kali Yuga when there are real excesses of materialism, when there is conflict, uh, when, when there is strife. We see that all around us. And I think... Um, particularly through our first object, we can nourish the sense of community among people, that sense of connectedness among people without any distinctions at all, with no distinctions. We need to show as an institution by example that we can live in a way in which we relate to anybody else regardless of the differences between us, uh, in a, a, a gesture, using a gesture of respect, of, of courtesy and consideration, and all in this atmosphere of free inquiry. And, and so I think there are different things that we can inculcate to the world as an institution, and we must never forget that we need to continue to make ourselves known. Many people have not heard about the Theosophical Society still, uh, but, but we have a wonderful um, ability to make it even better known today through the marvels of modern technology. Um, one of the uh, contradictions of the modern world, it seems to be that technology has made the world vastly interconnected, but there are still many barriers within the human mind. Racism is on the rise in a number of countries. Very divisive ideologies exist. And I think uh, the work of the society uh, exists, continues to exist to help to break down those barriers through understanding and through the dissemination of theosophy. Um, many years ago, in 1990, um, Mrs. Bournier conducted a, a two uh, seminars at Narden in Holland on human regeneration. And she defined the first object of the society in a very unique but practical manner. She said, universal brotherhood is a mind without barriers. So if we, if we really go deeply into the first object, for example, uh, that would be in itself a contribution to more interconnectedness in, in the world. And I try to mention this on the theosophical quiz, but in, at that night the mics were on strike for some mysterious reason. Now I think I can be heard. All I wanted to mention is that in a building behind the old post office called Community Kitchen, in the, soon after the founders settled down here in 1882, Corner Orchard held 
the very first community intercaste meals, which was a small revolution. Uh, I find myself in the rather unique position of being the international president of the organization about which this question is asked. You know, what is the responsibility of the Theosophical Society? Uh, over the years, not just here, but previously, I have had to do, you know, some formulation in my own mind and in my own approach to matters theosophical. Um, the Theosophical Society, in our invocation previous to the opening of each of these conventions, we ask for the aid and the guidance of those great ones for, whom, for whose work the society was founded. So this organization, this body, came into being for a specific work in the world. Uh, and it has grown and it has attempted uh, over the years that it has been in existence. It is uh, just one of the facts of anything that is materialized, anything that has form is that over time we develop traditions, over time we develop habits of thinking, habits of behavior, and they are developed with the idea to serve this purpose for which this society was founded. But periodically we do need to re-examine because obviously, you know, the 1800s are not the 20 are not the 20 hundreds. Uh, the human condition is the same in the sense that uh, the efforts to kind of stem the tide of needless and ignorant selfishness is the same, but the methods and the means and the manner in which it can make itself available for this greater work, that's what changes. HPB uh, worked herself to death in the process of writing books, articles, letters, thousands of pages during the course of a lifetime in order to reach out and to make this wisdom known. Uh, today, that would be, we would deem that an effort that is misplaced in the sense that, yes, words still need to be formulated and they need to be communicated, but to sit in the room with a pen and paper is not the way that this time has permitted other methods of doing it. So that's a small thing. But the idea that we need to be open it's an experiment that the masters initiated, this Theosophical Society. And it was one that could have failed, but fortunately has succeeded. So in the interest of continuing the experiment, we do need to have a certain degree of openness. We're very fortunate here at Adyar, at the international headquarters. First of all, we have beautiful space. We have people active-minded and committed people. And so we can point ourselves at various projects. And so here we have schools, we have uh, programs, we're doing more things with uh, ecological sorts of outreach. All of those things that uh, speak to this particular moment. The most important thing I feel that the Theosophical Society can do and that is needed is to become, is to be a place where people can shape themselves into examples, living examples of the teachings and of the behaviors that accompany the uh, approach to wisdom. Anyway, let's see. Someone asks, along the same line, 
how to translate the spiritual teachings on brotherhood and unity to the practice of real day-to-day -day life. Who would like that? Well, if there is no action in daily life, probably it's not wisdom. Uh, Brother Sri Heran, the fifth international president of the TS, said sometime that wisdom without action it's not wisdom, it's pseudo-wisdom. Then, we need to be conscious that this wisdom that we study in the books, to really be wisdom, need to be part of our lives. Does, this doesn't mean that we, are, we will be perfect. We may uh, in sometimes act erroneously, but we will be learning with our errors. The more important thing is to have the intention to do the right and to learn when we don't do the right thing. Then, for me, uh, the survival of the TS as something that really is important for the world is directly linked with this living theosophy. Because if it's not, we will be very good intellectuals. We can quote several authors, but if all the teaching does not interfere positively in our learning process in terms of living, it would not be uh, the goal that uh, is expected to us. Anyone else? I think we need to each go into what unity is and means for ourselves. To really think about that, one life, one thing, we are not separate parts. In our innermost core, we are absolutely united. And we can think for ourselves about ways in which this unity can be expressed in all kingdoms of nature. How do we relate better to other human beings? Relationship is key with all of this, but also be listening, watching, and being attentive. And watching our own responses to others, forgetting about ourselves, watching for opportunities to help, and looking at the other kingdoms of nature as well and how we live in relation to them. Are we living in a spirit of unity with those other kingdoms also? Unity has vast implications and I think we each need to work out for ourselves how we can actually put unity and a brotherhood, sisterhood into practice in everyday life. The learning ground is what we do from day to day. It's, it's the, the orbit of our experience in a given day. And if we are open, we truly can learn and we can reach more towards that unity uh, through the very way in which we live our lives. How we live our lives will inevitably also affect those who are around us. The more people who act from a point of view of unity, the more there will be a ripple effect 
uh, which extends beyond us to others as well. In 1883, as usual in December, there was a convention here, and one of the masters sent a message to the convention. In those days, those messages were air printed. It's very difficult to explain the, the uh, Madame Lavatsky called precipitation, but somebody received the printed message and read it out, probably Colonel Orchard. And the message ended with a, a very interesting statement. Blessings to all deserving them. So this, this has always been a, a fundamental point in, in theosophical understanding that uh, one has to make oneself ready. Um, and the same master when he came out of his long three months retreat, he wrote a letter to Mr. Sinnott and he said, I am self again. That's an indication of the depths of consciousness he was operating on. He said, I am self again. But what is self? A passing guest, a mirage in the desert. We give enormous importance to our own selves, uh, but the se this exacerbated sense of self is the source of so much suffering in the world. And in her dramatic language, Madame Blavatsky said in the Key to Theosophy about uh, duty, she said, each one of us owes a duty to humanity. She didn't say what it is. She left that for us to explore and discover. Each one of us owns a duty to humanity. And if we don't fulfill it, we will become spiritually insolvent in our next incarnation. Now, I didn't know there would be a spiritual bank in the next incarnation where our insolvency would be declared. But the meaning is very clear, that if our lives are based on self-centeredness, they cannot be helpful. Um, I guess the question being how to apply spiritual teachings in day-to-day -day life. Um, nothing really I have to add to what they say. Just share one thing that Annie Besant famously said. Uh, it's better not to speak, better not even to think if you're not prepared to take action. So in terms of our exposure to these various principles, yes, they're stimulating, no doubt. But then, you know, that next step, practice is an important part of that. So that is an action on your own behalf that benefits others as well. And for those who really have the desire to move in that direction, uh, the process is relatively simple. And uh, the guidance that is required is already before you, whoever you are. So act, I think, is the key word. All right, now, let me see. Well, there's a question here. Actually, it's two questions, uh, similar vein. Uh, one of them says, I am unable to meditate in spite of trying. What should I do? The second one says, why is meditation beneficial? So two sides of a similar question. So who would like to start us off on that? Let's go. Let's go toward the southern hemisphere. One of you. Uh, you you use your left arm. Are you implying that this is the left wing? <laughs> <laughs> no implication intended. No, no. <laughs> A anyhow, yes, the, the TS helped to introduce 
the subject of meditation in the Western world, and uh, in a very clear way, um, we have some very significant books on meditation in theosophical literature, which we can study, we can share with others, suggest the study of those books. And, but it was Joy Mills, our former international president and former president of the, both the American and the Australian section, uh, who coined a, a very useful expression to me at that time as a young theosophist. I can hardly imagine that 35 years have gone by, you know. <laughs> and she said, meditation is, is the art of learning to be present where one is. And I think it's quite a profound statement because it doesn't mean, it doesn't refer only to your immediate surroundings, but also your presence on this earth. So, um, uh, um, and also as a young theosopher, I used to buy a number of books from the Theosophical Publishing House at Wheaton. And they, somebody gave me a, um, a bookmark which I keep at home um, a, a, as a very good uh, pointer on meditation. It simply said, meditation is not what you think. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> With these two questions, uh, one which inevitably arises also is what is meditation? One can think of it as a multi-stage process, really. Uh, some people are able to simply become quiet and that can help to relieve stress. But meditation in its entirety is a very rich process. And if we think about Patanjali, for example, it would go through a few stages. One would be a conscious withdrawal of the senses so that one is not focused on the world around one and drawn hither and thither. Uh, and then focusing on a chosen object to the exclusion of all else, that's the ideal dharana or concentration uh, and then taking this still deeper so that there is this kind of flow of movement towards the object uh, so that there is uh, a, a deeper state of consciousness again. Uh, eventually of course the great mystics have experienced what might be called contemplation or samadhi uh, but, but meditation itself is something which is uh, quite profound. Uh, I think one of the greatest benefits is that it can, when it's undertaken on a regular basis and over many years, um, even for a short while each day, it can be tremendously calming uh, to the various vehicles and can help us much in everyday life with our responses to things and uh, can help, I think, also help us to understand more our own place in the immensity of life. Uh, in relation to the question was why, why can't I meditate, was it? Why am I unable to meditate? Why am I, I unable to meditate? Well, first of all, Meditation is not for everyone. It is certainly encouraged in the Theosophical Society as well as study and service. But for some people who really find that their minds are so active they cannot sit down, for example, to formal meditation, they may like to try, try a very slow walking meditation. I believe that's taking place during this convention actually early in the mornings. Uh, or just listening to some music, uh, to some calming music, something like that. 
I don't think that one should be too upset if, if one cannot uh, really meditate in that formal sense. But perhaps with the passing of time, one can come back to it and it will happen again later on. But there are alternatives that one can try if it's simply too impossible. And uh, one of the other recommendations again and again also is to simply come back to the breath and watch the breath go in and out. That can help to calm the mind down as well. Well, this is a profound question. What is meditation? If we look by the external point of view, we will think about the practice. Someone close the room, sit comfortably, and take 15 to 30 minutes, try to control or try to quiet him or herself. The practice is very good because since the time we wake up to the time we go to sleep, we are focused in uh, external things all the time. Then have some time to say, well, for this time, everything may happen. I will look for inside. It's a good thing. It's a practice. But is it the necessarily meditation? The, it depends on the level we took the question. Uh, Krishnamurti says that meditation starts where thought ends. But how to stop thought? If you try to force it, it will escape. Then it's a condition of observing him or herself, observing everything that happened in your inner space, every feeling, every thought. As much as you observe, quietness tends to come. Then, uh, meditation is not separated to everything you do during the day, or even during the time you are sleeping. There are lots of energies going and coming inside ourselves. Are we conscious about that all kinds of energies? To be aware of each one carefully, not fighting with them, but observing. That is the beginning of meditation. It's not so difficult, but each one needs to find his or her own way to calm him or herself, to quiet him or herself. And then, in the moments that this silence comes, then we understand what is meditation. I'm very much, uh, I very much like the quote that Pedro shared about meditation is not what you think, and I find myself uh, mentioning that frequently. Uh, it has a certain wit to it, but it's also profound. The idea that meditation, what we call meditation, what is meditation, doesn't occur until we have somehow been able to separate ourselves from the thoughts and the process of thinking. Thoughts don't go away, but you know, just like we're able to rise out of water in a pool, water's still there, but we're not wet with it at that time. One of the things that I think is, for many people, a powerful, not alternative to meditation, but complementary, in a way it's the other side of the meditation coin, if approached properly. Uh, and it's something that is perhaps more familiar to most of the people in the world. And in, 
India, in particular, we think in terms of mantra. So there are expressions of aspiration, words of power that can connect us more deeply. They can bring about a certain stillness that is in every way similar to the stillness of meditation. But in other places, it's described as prayer. And prayer has gotten something of a difficult ride within the Tias because the focus on how it is misused you know, generally, in many, many places, prayer is just a glorified form of begging for something you don't really deserve. <laughs> That's kind of the way many people use it. But at its depth, it is an expression in words or silently, an acknowledgement of a connection with the divine. And in that acknowledgement, in a way, we are speaking to the divine, but at a certain point, just like in a conversation, it's a monologue if you don't stop talking. So we place ourselves before the divine and we sit and we listen. And on occasions, there's a response. But it's the exact same thing. It's a different approach and it's one that perhaps might be more appealing depending on our temperament. Meditation of the type of sitting on a cushion quietly is not the avenue for everyone. But whatever avenue it is, all of this is a matter of practicing meditation. People, when they're sitting on their cushions, you'll ask them when they get up, what did you do? I was meditating. Only on rare occasions is that true. We were sitting we were watching the breath, we were practicing trying to become still, but the removal from this thought process is, isn't the norm. So that's something that perhaps might appeal to it, people of a different Tim, temperament. Tim, can I, can I just add something? I wish you would. Uh, just to give an illustration of how deep prayer can go, and by the way, in the theosophical tradition, there is not much room for prayer because Madame Lavatsky was not very favorable to it in the key to theosophy. No, but, but she was criticizing petitionary prayer. Right. But just as an illustration of how deep prayer can go, one of the great Christian mystics, Meister Eckhart, wrote, actually delivering his sermon, he said, when you really pray, you don't exist. Only God exists. Mm. Mm -hmm. While we're on Meister Eckhart, if the only prayer you can say is thank you, it will have been enough. <laughs> Let's not go down the Meister Eckhart trail. We'll be here for only on talking about Meister. All right, so let's ask this then. What is the contribution or relevance of science, of science and education, to the current situation and to the interconnection? A broad question. Who would like to take it somewhere? The president. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pedro. <laughs> The contribution or relevance of science. Science is the most authoritative religion of our time, uh, is one way to put it. It has a certain quality of, uh, in its contemporary practice, it has a certain quality of an ism. Scientism is that version of science which tries to confine reality to what uh, certain forms of experimentation can reveal. So that's, but its role has been that it has become really the focus. You, know, you cannot afford to appear unscientific in today's world. Nobody wants to be labeled as that. It makes you think that you just crawled out of a cave somewhere if you have that sort of point of view. But 
Science has earned its place as the leading light for a human endeavor because it is provable, repeatable by anyone who can undertake its level of experimentation. The problem, of course, has been that it has, certain, it has imposed upon itself certain limitations that are, from the point of view of the ageless wisdom, uh, needlessly confining and guaranteed to uh, limit uh, a proper view of reality. So the fact that science is powerful, the fact that it is everywhere regarded in spiritual circles, I think we know that there is also the factor of consciousness, which is unconsidered and unconsiderable within the uh, scientific realm. So that's something that I think is uh, very, very important. This question asks for science and education to the current situation. I should say, too, uh, science has become so predominant that when we look at human-created issues in the world, generally people try to look to technological solutions for the problems we have created, which are problems really more based on values and misplaced values. So that's something that is uh, challenging, to be able to appreciate and to utilize science without falling under the spell of a yet another limiting point of view. I think I should allow Pedro to speak at this point. When I was a young student of philosophy in Brazil, uh, we studied the, the works of a French philosopher called Maurice Merleau-Ponty. His school was um, uh, his line of um, uh, development was one of um, um, hermeneutics um, and also traditional philosophy. And he said something that stayed with me all these years. Um, and of course, he was not against science, but he could see this, as uh, uh, Tim said, about certain limitations which are self-imposed in the scientific thinking. Merleau-Ponty said, uh, his school of thought was phenomenology. He said, science manipulates things but refuses to dwell in them. In other words, there are some fundamental concepts for science like energy, motion, and so on, and there are certain scientific descriptions of this. But if you take the question of consciousness, even the most uh, famous neuroscientists in the world, they still consider consciousness as a problem because they cannot explain from where it is born. And I have read this, and one of them said that consciousness is a byproduct of the chemistry of the brain. Yeah. Now, if Sri Shankaracharya was here, uh, he would have certainly a different view on this. but. But the important thing about science is, and I think this is why it has grown enormously, and this is why I think it is part of the second object of the TS, is that to no theory was given the status of ultimate truth. Every theory can be defeated by another theory if the, another, if the other theory is good enough. So this is a very important point, that this, this intrinsic freedom from inquiry and freedom of thought, which is an inherent mechanism of scientific activity, is very important. But also the question mentioned education, mm -hmm. and more and more you can see how a holistic education is gaining ground in the world which is not an education 
which is piecemeal, you know, uh, and, and that emphasizes only one aspect. Uh, uh, for example, in Brazil, when the military took over the country through a military coup, they, they removed philosophy from the curriculum of all national schools, but they kept it in the military schools where I was studying. So I must say, <laughs> I was benefited by that. But I think this is very clear, this holistic sense that the different disciplines are not pigeonholes. They, are, they interact with each other. They help the child or the student to understand that they live in, in, in an interactive world. And um, so I think science can, continues to be very relevant. And I think I won't see a scientist embracing the theosophical world of consciousness, but probably I don't deserve that. <laughs> A couple of comments about science and the current situation. First of all, I think one of the greatest services that science can do for the planet at the present time is to help us find ways of living more sustainably. Uh, there's obviously a growing push in this direction now because of the climate crisis that we face but I think science has a very important role indeed in helping us to live better on this planet, to use our resources responsibly and so forth. Uh, also, it was I think in about 1987 that a book was published, edited by David Lorimer, called The Spirit of Science, in which he gathered together a number of writings of prominent scientists, I think, through the 20th century, who also had a very definite uh, spiritual or mystical leaning, uh, which contains some fascinating material. And I think science also, uh, particularly uh, some of the, the really deep thinking scientists and um, physicist, physicists feature here as well, uh, has a role to play in helping, uh, if you like, more mainstream humanity understand that there are these mysteries beyond the physical world uh, which we can reach towards. I find that very exciting. Uh, in relation to education and the current situation, which I assume means the current global situation, education has a huge role to play, really, uh, in many ways, we are the product of our education, apart from other factors as well. I am enormously heartened by the existence of some theosophical schools now. And those of you who have visited the Golden Link School in the Philippines uh, will no doubt be incredibly impressed with the work done there. And to have the Theosophical Academy here at Adia now, which I visited a day or two ago, uh, is truly inspirational. The, the quality of education that children have will uh, help in no small part to shape the kind of person they become and how they live their lives. So education does indeed have a critical role. I think that one of the purpose of the TS since the beginning was to build bridges between science, religion, and philosophy. And we can see science by the aspect technological and by the aspect of the approach to life. And uh, we see now uh, science in vanguard as quantum physics that uh, start to reach points related to ancient philosophy and things like that. Then I, I think that the TS itself has contributed to this, to, to diminish this big distance between all these ways to approach life. And even technology that develops 
based on commercial interests. Now we, we are in a condition to make education in a very different way, in a transformative way, because it's not needed anymore to record in the brain all the information. You go to Google or on the other source, you have all information available. It's not needed to fulfill the mind with information and information. Then I think uh, humanity is ready to receive this uh, uh, transformative education that the TS is trying to bring to the world. Krishnamurti did the same. And uh, this education is completely different to, uh, as has been said here in one talk, uh, to, to bring what is inside of the children, not to uh, condition the children with all our concepts and values and uh, information and that. It's a, a kind of flourishing from inside that education uh, may provide. Then I think all these things are interconnected. Uh, the society itself was very well conceived to act in human consciousness at all. And uh, the important thing, as I said, is to continue to be as a vanguard in all this process. All right, we have time probably for maybe one more question. There was one question I would have liked to have talked about, but we don't have time for everything. I'll just tell you what it was, because I like it. What are your thoughts on rest, and how do you do it? Nice question, but uh, I'll let you all rest on that one. We'll ask the other one. What is one of the most important or most special takeaways for you from this convention? Flip a coin. Oh. He heads. Okay, it's Linda. <laughs> <laughs> Today, the world has opened up in a, in a different kind of sphere with the advent of COVID. So many of us are now having online meetings, which certainly serve a purpose and have helped retain a certain sense of connectedness during these extremely difficult times, uh, which are not finished yet. But there is something about gathering together in person that cannot be replicated online. Uh, so that authentic connectivity uh, between human beings, I believe, takes place more fully in the physical company of others in the same place. So I think this has been a very happy occasion, really, to be able to gather here in Adia for the first time in four years, I believe it is, uh, after what has seemed to be a long hiatus. And it's in this atmosphere that some uh, very beautiful energies thrive uh, and one can feel the influences present here at Adia very keenly. Uh, so during the last few days, uh, this has been vivified and it can only... I believe, move out towards the world and help it in various ways. So I, th I think the, the inspiration and that uh, beautiful divine energy, which is uh, both generated and further vivified during a convention such as this, uh, is my takeaway. Yes, uh, the program was very beautifully designed. It, it, the, there is diversity in the program for the convention. Uh, we had s some very uh, outstanding lectures. Um, and uh, the facilities of the campus have been improved a great deal. 
The last, the 31st time I came to RDR, which was in October 1989, until now, I never had a hot shower. <laughs> It was rather strange, you know, I, I, particularly because we arrived very late at night. The, well, there was hot water, so, and the credits go to the president and his team. Um, but to me, the interaction with the delegates uh, is very important. I was very touched because during this time, I was meeting some watchmen that were here when I was working here 25 years ago, and they still remembered him, me. Um, uh, and I asked them, do you remember my name? They had to think a little and then they would say it. <laughs> and other workers as well. So um, I think this is all part of the convention. But uh, to me there is a particular aspect which is embodied in one statue at the museum that sums up why we are here and what we can take from such a convention. It is the statue of the girl with her little brother. The full story, I did some research, the full story is some he, he, the, the brother is not a baby, he's a young boy, a, young, a, a baby boy, but uh, he, he doesn't have the stature of a baby. So somebody saw her and asked the question, is he not too heavy for you? And her answer was, no, he is my brother. Well, for me, by the physical point of view, this place, Adya, is the heart of the Theosophical movement, of Theosophical society. I think this place is strongly magnetized by the leaders that, that lived here, HPB, Alcott, Anibesan, all them, and uh, even the masters, came here, then the place itself has a strong magnetism. And each one that is a little sensitive can feel and uh, see how important this place is for the Theosophical Society and for the Theosophical Movement. Then, for me to come back here, uh, after four years, it's really a new input of energy for all the year, I suppose, uh, because we really need to have this energy to develop our work everywhere. And we can see that this pandemic was something not only biological, but something psychic, something that interferes in the feelings of people, everything. And now we are emerging from a hard process, but uh, reborning strongly, is as I feel. And we need to really push our colleagues, the TS, because as Linda said, the online meetings are very good for people who are far. But for people who are next, probably it's bad, because people, don't, people are accommodated to be only at home and switch on the computer, switch off the computer. It's completely different to be in contact, to to develop our first object, because our work is not just intellectual to, to share thinking. We need to relate to, to ourselves. Then it's completely different face-to-face -face meetings to online meetings in that aspect. Then we need to push our society 
to come back. In, in our country, some places, the, the, the place itself closed because people were paying a rent for have a place. Now they are have online meetings, they don't want to pay the rent anymore. This interferes in the quality of our work. Then you need to come back to really reborn with the energy to fulfill what the Holy Ones expect from us for this work that is for all humanity. Uh, I can add very little to the things that have been said. I particularly resonate with what uh, Linda had to say. It's been four years since we were last in each other's presence at a convention at a moment like this. Uh, coming back together like this again should remind us of something. We're here in a place that is an extraordinary place on earth. It is a place that has been used for a very specific purpose over a long time. And we have the opportunity to sit in it, to connect with one another in this space. Very often during these conventions, I know for myself, it's a very busy time. Busyness means a lot of movement, a lot of talking, a lot of interaction. And sometimes, if we're not careful, it means a minimum of quiet. Right now, you know, as we close this session, we have the opportunity to not just be aware of the presence that we feel among each other, but the presence that surrounds us. This was described as the master's home. The master's home. It's a special quiet. It's a special power that emanates from us being able to become sufficiently still and connect ourselves. So for me, the great takeaway has been that we come back together again and that we rest in this place. We are recharged by it and we add our energy to what's here and we take it out. That's the point of this. So with that, I would like to thank my eminent co-panelists. From my left, I'm sorry, <laughs> Pedro Oliveira, Linda Oliveira, Marcos de Resende. So thank you all. This session is now closed. <laughs>